take off right at a crucial time in the Sunday school class, and it'll look like they're mad at the teacher as they step out, and, uh, and they'll slip out early. <laughs> Just know that they're not mad. They, this is pre-planned. This is, <laughs> it's pre-planned. Pre-planned to make it look, you know, to add a little excitement to the class, you know, to make sure some old oh, brother Dan, he's got them all stirred up. And uh, no, that's, that's not why. So you'll see a lot coming and going. There's uh, several, as, as the weeks have gone by, we've, we've been able to uh, see some here that have been listening online. Miss Joyce is in the back, wave at us, and uh, she's hiding back there, and uh, she's able to be here today. And uh, so many, uh, because of health situations, or maybe their spouse has a health situation, has not allowed them to be around people, and so they've had to stay at home, and they get to listen and watch online. They're doing that now. Everybody turn around and wave at them. There they are. All right. That makes them feel like they're part of the class, and they are, and we're so glad for that. And so, um, but we are so excited when we get to see them in person because nothing beats in person. Um, you know, I've said this before, and, I'll, and, and it, it bears mentioning again. Um, I'm a very uh, introvert person. I prefer solitude and quiet. Just ask my wife, um, and sometimes she'll say, are, are you listening to me? And I'll be listening. I'm just, you know, just listening, you know, doing my part. Hallelujah. And uh, when it's time to interject, then I'll interject. But I can be very reclusive if I'm not careful, and that's not good for me. It's not good for me to be reclusive, because I need to be around you. And uh, you need to be around us as well. It does us good. That's why the scripture says in Hebrews 10, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And so much the more, as you see the day approaching, as things get worse in the world, preparing for the coming of Christ, we need each other more now than we ever have. And we exhort one another. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. You get to be around people of like faith. People of like faith. People of like circumstances. You have things that are happening in your life that are very similar to what others have happening. And it's good to hear from someone else that they're going through something too. That you're not the only one that gets to suffer. You want somebody else to suffer with you. Not really, but, you know, it does feel better to know that you're not the only one going through some things. Okay, we have to get after it uh, because time is short. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24, we'll be looking at several verses throughout this chapter. We started out last week with uh, part number five of a series that we're talking about uh, igniting or firing up our spiritual passion. We're talking about spiritual revival. Because as, as revival happens in our hearts, it will happen in our marriage, it will happen in our family, it will happen in our church, it will happen in our community, as it happens in our heart. If it does not happen in your heart, you're not going to experience it on a large scale. So we want, we want to be right before God. We want our heart to be what it needs to be before God. Why? Because I don't want to get in the way of what God has planned here at Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church or in this community. I want to be, I want to be right with God. I want to walk with the Lord. I love walking with the Lord and hearing from Him and having speak to, to my heart, having Him show me things. I enjoy that. That's something that I treasure. That's why, and as you mentioned earlier, that's why we do what we do. We do it out of a heart of love, out of a heart of gratitude. So we talked about having been hurt before. And based on the reaction that we got last week, pretty much everyone in this room, in some form or fashion, has been hurt by others. And most of us, if not all of us, have been hurt by Christians. Right? We have. 
And we looked at how that there's some facts about forgiveness. Number one was people are going to hurt you. Often, unjustifiably. People are going to hurt you, often unjustifiably. We talked about that last week. We also talked about, number two, that you will be tempted to hurt them in return. Yes! You will be tempted to hurt them in return. But we saw how that does not belong to us. That's not our purview. That is not something, that's not a liberty that God gives us. That's not our responsibility. God takes care of that. Listen, I just had a phone call two days ago, and I took it in the parking lot out here. And it was of a situation where I had justified opportunity to defend myself, and I chose not to. And someone who suspected that something was going on but couldn't put their finger on it called me and asked me specific questions. And this, this situation happened, I'm going to say, about seven years ago. And just now, it came out. And they asked me specific questions that I was able to answer now. And they thought, well, I knew something was up. And they were very pleased to hear what we had to say. But it was a situation where at the moment, I could not, the Holy Spirit of God would not allow me to say something. And I could have. And I, be, I would have been justified in doing it. Because I had done nothing wrong. But we chose to go the Holy Spirit path. And I am so glad I did. I am so glad. Because when the Holy Spirit takes care of that matter, He does it in such a way. Remember we talked about vindication last week? He will vindicate you. He will make it look, he'll make you look a lot better than you can look by yourself. And he does a great job at it, as well as preserving the unity of the saints. And so that's very important. We talked about that. Number three, let's start there. I don't know if we quite covered this one last week, but we'll go ahead and start here. Failure to forgive... I believe this is where we stopped. We stopped on number two. Failure to forgive hurts you more than anyone else. Failure to forgive will hurt you more than anyone else. 1 Samuel 24 and verse 5. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Yeah, I know, it, it sounds funny, but that's what they called the clothing and the garment back then, and he had cut off a piece of it. He had snuck in at night, if you, if, if you remember what we had read, and he had every opportunity to take his life. But what he did instead is he just cut off a piece of his garment, and then he stood up on the hill far enough away and said, Hey, look what we could have done while you were snoozing to lose. And, um, but he says here in verse 5, and it came to pass afterward that his heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. Listen to how he still refers to Saul. He calls him his master. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth my hand against him seeing he is anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants, or he kept them with, his, with these words, and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. So very interesting what he said here. Bitterness, or not forgiving someone, because I believe that one can, 
can maintain a, a state of non-forgiveness before it, enter, it enters into an area called bitterness. But the non-forgiveness is a quality which consumes the vessel which contains it. And when you carried harbored hurt, and we did say, we did talk about how that this was unjustified hurt. Someone has done you wrong, and they should not have done you wrong. And you're right in feeling bad about someone doing you wrong, unjustifiably. But when you guard that, it consumes the vessel which contains it. And when you carry that harbored hurt, it always turns to bitterness. And bitterness always, always corrupts. We turn our backs on hurts and we try to say they don't matter. But hurt does not go away. It festers and it soon begins to torment. Jesus told the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. And in it, he described the place of torment reserved for someone who refuses to forgive. And he said, should, not have, uh, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? Is what he refers to it. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers or to the torturers until he should pay all his debt. Remember that in Matthew, where he forgave, uh, one was forgiven of a large debt, and then he turns around and he goes after somebody that owes him something small and has him jailed or tormented or tortured because of it. Then Jesus commented on the story by adding, So shall my heavenly Father also do to you. That part we don't look at very often, do we? If each of you does not forgive his brother from the heart, failure to forgive does have heavy consequences. Because when you carry a load of bitterness, it is physically demanding. It will affect you physically. It's emotionally exhausting. It's exhausting. It will suck the emotion right out of you. And you can tell when somebody is bitter. You can tell. They, they react. They snap when, they, when you talk to them. It is mentally tormenting. Relationally, it isolates people. Relationally. And it is spiritually crushing. If we hold a grudge in our hearts, let's look at Proverbs. Hold your place there, but go to Proverbs 26, 24. I'd like to ask someone in the room to read this for me. Proverbs 26, 24. Whoever finds it first and would like to read it, just read it out loud for us. Proverbs 26, 24. Okay, thank you. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. When, when an individual is holding that grudge, you are an easy prey to gossip. You're an easy prey to gossip. Something else, we're in Proverbs. Let's look at 17.20. Someone read 1720 for me. Proverbs 1720. He that hath a forward heart findeth no good. He that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. Okay, thank you. When you're holding that grudge, you assume negative about people. Automatically negative. Well, that's 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 about right. Yep, that, that would be how they'd act. Yeah, because that's, that's just how they do. Don't we do that? The other thing, Proverbs 24, verse 17 and 18. Someone read that one for me, please. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17 and 18. Lest the Lord see it and it displeased him and he turn away his wrath from him. 
Did you catch that last verse? When we rejoice, if we are holding a grudge, we rejoice when others fall. And God says, hey, when he sees that, when he sees you happy that somebody else fell, then what it does is it displeases God and he turns his wrath from that person. You want to keep the fire on that person? Don't be happy when, they, when something goes wrong with them. Have compassion on them. And God will continue to do that work. In, now, I don't believe God is such, such that he's, gonna, he's just going to come out of heaven and he's going to wail on them just to wail on them. You know personally in your life when you're bent out of shape, you know how God has worked in your life and in your heart and how he treats you. He does the very same with those that hurt you. He loves them just as much. And he will apply that same compassion, that same patience, and he will work in their life. If that individual, if that individual gets stubborn with God and they're a child of God, remember we talked about this, he will chasten them. But he applies perfect chastening for that individual. And it may not look like what you think it needs to look like. Because he knows that individual more than you do. Thank God we're not God. My soul. We'd have wiped out people a long time ago. This would be a lonely place to live if we were God. Because how many times would have said, Zap! You're done! And just like those bug zappers, you know, on the porch in the summer, that bug comes up and bzz, boom, and it falls. Bam. That's what would happen all around us if we were God. Thank God that we are not God. Number four, God will forgive us like we forgive others. David refused to carry a grudge against Saul, and though David was pursued... He was hounded and he was demeaned. He was free in his heart while Saul was captive to his own hatred. Do you know that if you do not guard bitterness or hold a grudge or unforgiveness in your heart against someone, that that is freeing? And you can walk around and listen, this individual will be miserable. When you just walk around and you treat them with kindness as Christ would treat them, it will drive them batty. If you ever want to get back at somebody, and now that's the wrong root cause, isn't it? <laughs> but if you ever wanted to get back at somebody, just be nice to them. Just pour it on. And just say, you know what, I am praying for you because it is so freeing. And it, it just, it keeps you in that, listen, you can lay your head down on your pillow at night and you can rest knowing that you don't have something in your heart against that. Now, I didn't say subject yourself to more abuse. I didn't say stand in front of the truck again. <laughs> God gives you something between your ears to help you stay out of situations that you've found out that that's not a very good situation to be in. God expects us to use the wisdom and the intelligence that he gives us to remove ourselves from, from hostile situations and remove yourself from being abused. You can do that. But when you don't hold your gr a grudge, you don't hold unforgiveness, you don't hold bitterness in your heart against that person, it's very freeing. You can go about, you can see that individual in the grocery aisle, and you can say hi to them, and they will duck their head and try to avoid you. Sometimes we found ourselves in that very situation where we've held something against them or maybe we've done something wrong or we forgot to do something that we were supposed to do and, oh my soul, there's so-and-so. <laughs> you know you know how it is. And, and, and just being transparent and honest, that is very captivating. It's very, uh, it, it, it's condemning. So 
when, when, we, when we refuse to carry that grudge, it's, it frees us in our heart. Saul here was captive to his own hatred. In a way, once he started down that path, he had to continue that path. And forgiving someone is the best thing that you can do for yourself. Just forgive them. Just forgive them. It's one of the best things that you can do. Number five, forgiveness involves leaving revenge into the hands of a faithful God. And we've, we've touched on this. But in verses 12 through 15 of our scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 24... Back to 1 Samuel 24, and verse 12, the Bible says, The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee. Notice how he phrased that. The Lord not just avenged me, but he avenged me of thee. Get, he, he, get rid of you for my sake, basically. And the Lord, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. I'm not going to do anything to pay back. As saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom, the Bible says in 14, after whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursuit? After a dead dog, after a flea. Why are you wasting your time on me? I'm nothing to you. Did you ever wonder that? Here's the king of an entire country. And he's spending his time on a shepherd boy. On someone who is considered the least in that society. On an insignificant individual. Why are you wasting your... But that's what holding a grudge does. That's what unforgiveness does. That's what bitterness does. It chases down some of the most insignificant things, and it doesn't let up. 15 says, The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see, and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. David chose here to leave revenge in the hands of God. He believed that God was the ultimate judge, and he is, and was big enough to take care of him, and that, ensuing, uh, that, that the ensuing chapters reveal the clear faithfulness of God on David's behalf. So forgiveness is my responsibility. By a choice of the will that God placed in each and every one of us to release a debt by faith to glorify God. Let me read that again. Forgiveness, that's my responsibility. By a choice of the will that God gave me to release that debt by faith to glorify God. My responsibility, it's always my responsibility for, to forgive. And for sake of time, we won't read these verses. If you're writing these down, write down Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Matthew 6, 12 through 15. By a choice of the will that God gave me, forgiveness is not an act of my emotions. Because my emotions at that moment want to clock somebody upside the head. That's what my emotions want to do. And if you're honest with yourself, that's what you want to do. Sometimes you just want to... Right? Or react. But forgiveness is not an act of emotion, but it's an act of will. It's an act of will. I can choose, and thanks be to God that as a believer... He has placed the Holy Spirit in my heart. I am no longer chained to sin. I don't have to sin. I don't have to sin. I can choose to forgive a debt that someone owes me. Some say, well, I can't. You don't know what they did to me. And the truth is that God 
could not be a perfect God if he asked you to do something you couldn't do by his grace. He wouldn't be perfect if he didn't ask you to do something that he couldn't do by his grace. To release a debt. Forgiveness is releasing what I am holding in my heart against them. I feel like they owe me respect, honor, etc. But the reality is, as a believer, I owe them, according to 1 Corinthians 13, and according to Romans 13, 8, I owe them the debt of love. I'm a debtor, Paul says. We owe them that as a believer. By faith, forgiveness means that I believe in God. I believe that God is big enough to deal with the individual who has hurt me, and instead of being the judge, jury, and the executioner, which I want to be, I transfer this case to heaven's jurisdiction. God says that we are to leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Romans 12, 19. Is that not correct? And to glorify God, my ultimate purpose in my life is for God to be glorified. The heart of the gospel is forgiveness. That's at the very base. It's the very heart of the gospel. I am never more like God than when I forgive. Do I desire for my life to glorify God? Then I must forgive. I have no option not to. So the application here, the question is, do you believe God? Do you believe that he is big enough to take care of these matters for you? Do you believe that he is big enough to handle the situation in your life that maybe only you and he know about? know about and the individual that hurts you? Do you believe that he is big enough to take care of those that hurt you? If you do, then forgive. Forgive. One more step in this issue of forgiveness, and that is to love those who have hurt us. And this is hard. Love those that have hurt us. David not only refused to take revenge, but then he chooses to love and to honor someone that hurt him. That's hard. Christ says that this would be the most astounding illustration of the fact that we are connected to him, that if we love our enemies, the God of love who lives inside of you is available to pour his love through you and if you'll, make, if you'll make it available to him to do that, he will do that. It's not you loving on that person. It's God's love through you to that individual. You may say, I, man, I don't know. So as you search your heart, is there any name in that ledger book that we spoke of last week? Is there anyone who has hurt you in a big or a small way that you're holding something against? God has one simple word for us today, and that is forgive. If we were to apply just a minimal amount of the forgiveness that he applies to us in our life, if we were to apply that to those who have hurt us, it would change our lives dramatically. We would be free from that guilt. We would be free from that burden. God does say, casting all your cares upon him. And that's just not, oh, here, I'm just going to place it right there. No, that's literally taking it and just slinging it at him. Here, take this. I'm about ready to kill somebody here. Take, just take this. Get, get this off my plate. Because, man, if, I, if, if I'm taking care of it, it's not going to be pretty. You ever heard that? Mom and dad, dad comes in from work, says, hey, listen, you better go take care of that boy. Because if I get a hold of him, I'm going to kill him. We experience this in real life. There's people, that, there's people that, that treat us in such a way that it causes you to want to hurt somebody. That's normal. If you've got blood flowing through your veins, that's normal. And if you've got high blood pressure, whoo, even more normal. 
right? Just give it to God and apply that forget. Let him, let him run his love through you. That's all we are as a conduit. You say, well, he's going to get by with it. You think so? If he's a child of God, he ain't getting by with it. We read that. He chastened whom he loves and whom he considers a child. And the ones that are not, then they're just acting like the heathen that they are. And you just pray that they need a little Jesus in their life. That's all they need. They need, they need. And if they don't, they don't get right. This is the only heaven that they're going to enjoy because they're headed to a place that is really bad. And you don't want that for them. You would never want that for anyone. Doesn't matter if they've hurt you or not. Let's forgive. Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit of God, thank you for showing me what I need to know in order to live this Christian life that I so enjoy. And Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'll help each and every one of us in this room to take those hurts that have been dealt to us unjustifiably. And Lord, I pray that we would just give them to you and let you handle that situation. And Lord, I pray that your love would be shown through us to these individuals in our lives. And may they see you in us. If they're not saved, may they be saved. If they are saved, may they learn what it is to walk with you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you very much. You're dismissed. And if we could, I've asked the question.